Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie, and I would like to welcome everybody here to CLC. Whether you're here in church, you're live, or you're outside in the parking lot, we welcome you. I have a few announcements for you this morning. Um, in your um, pew there, you will see a Connect card. If you are um, new here, um, or you just want to get to know us a little bit better, we ask that you fill this out. Um, if you don't want to have it in your pew, you can find it also out in the Welcome Center. Um, we have Cal, which is Connect, on Wednesday. Um, and this Wednesday, we have something really special. We have some of the kids from Urban Promise coming to share with us with their writings. Um, and there are some members of the congregation who have been helping them write these. So um, I um, encourage you to come and see. They've worked so hard on these, and um, I'm just excited to see what they have uh, come up with. So that starts at 6.30, but at 5.30 we have a delicious meal prepared. And this week we have beef tacos, guacamole, rice, and corn, which will be again at 5.30, right outside um, in the Big Yellow Mug Cafe. Um, so it's always a great time to fellowship. So we can fellowship and then we can listen to some um, of the great writings from the children from Urban Promise. We also have, um, if you noticed when you walked in, if you walked in on the kids' side, you saw our um, lovely Big Yellow Mug. So um, we are advertising that for our soft opening in the cafe right out here. We have um, March 29th and April 5th, the big yellow mug right inside here will be open from 6 a.m. to 12 noon. So if you're on your way to work, you want to stop in for a cup of coffee, you want to meet some friends here, um, it will be open again March 29th and April 5th from 6 a.m. to 12 noon. And um, Easter's coming up which means we have lots of fun and exciting things going on. Um, we're gonna kick off our Easter season here with our community-wide Easter egg hunt, which is going to be April 1st, which is this Saturday. Um, the doors will open at 9.30 and we'll go until 12 o'clock. We have lots of fun and exciting things um, planned. So if you are not busy and you want to come and if you've got some kids bring them along there's um there's lots of fun activities also uh, we have a couple services we have our Monday Thursday Good Friday and Easter services and you can head on over to our website clcfamily.church backslash Easter to find out all the information on that you can also find the information for our community Easter egg hunt there as well and I'm sure you've seen the bulletin boards and everything around so it's going to be a great event for a wonderful season. Um, if you're already a part of our CLC family and you want to support the church, you can again head on over to our website, which is clcfamily.church backslash give. There's also a um, envelope in your pew if you'd rather give that way. Um, so for everything else, we've got lots of fun and exciting things going on. You can go over to our website and click on our newsletter, which you can also subscribe to right on there. Again, our website, clcfamily.church backslash news. And now I'm going to turn it over for the call to worship. Morning, church. Good morning, church. <laughs> All right. Our, our call to worship this morning is from Deuteronomy uh, 32 and 33. And I invite you to stand as you're able, either physically or in spirit, as we begin our service. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. And if you could join me with this. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I'm leaning on your everlasting arms So close to you that I can hear your heart Nothing else can separate me from your love I'm leaning on your everlasting arms In the morning I am met with your mercy in the evening I am wrapped in your love There's no end to your reach There's 
There's no place I'd rather be. I'm leaning on your everlasting arms. I'm resting in your never-ending peace. Patiently I wait to hear you speak. Nothing else can see me safe from every soul. There's a place for 
continue our worship I want to encourage you to not miss this opportunity so we are here to worship we are here to, to change our gaze from ourselves to one who is greater to one whose everlasting arms are open for us to one who we can call father I don't know if you're like me but sometimes I get tied up in just me where the weather can get me down bills can get me down, a test for school can get me down, like you name it, and I'm, I'm stuck just gazing at, at down and at myself. Every time we come together, we have the opportunity to lift our gaze to something greater, to lift our gaze beyond the temporal and where we're at now to something eternal. So I would encourage you, if you're still struggling, to lift your gaze. Don't miss this opportunity. As we sing this next song, Shift your eyes and lift your gaze up to the one who is greater than us. Sings my soul, my Savior. 
Let us pray. Oh God, you are great and greatly to be praised. We are so thankful to be able to take these words upon our lips. We don't have to be learned to turn from the beautiful things that causes our hearts to leap up with thanksgiving. We don't have to be learned to make that known to you. We don't have to be righteous. We don't have to have had a great week. We don't have to feel in our spirit a surge of triumph. We can feel weak. We can be confused. Uh, we can be tossed about. And yet you are our never failing refuge. And we can turn from all of that and give you glory for the beauty around us, for the grace that enables us to carry burdens and yet not only live and breathe, but have your praise within our breath. Lord, you are so awesome, and every day you display countless, infinite reasons to prompt our worship. You were so creative. And we enter into this season, O oh God, praying that you would open the eyes of our hearts and we would lift our eyes to you to ever turn from these things to worship you. We come also, Lord, um, not only boldly with praise, whatever our weak or condition is, but we come also boldly confessing our need, our failures. We are afflicted with a fickleness of our own heart that needs to constantly be strengthened and find a new resolve that you provide for us. Lord, we confess where we have strayed from you in thought, in word, in our deeds, in either not doing things that we know are paths of righteousness and safety for us that you've commanded. Forgive us for not doing those things. Or in trespassing across lines that you clearly have said there is no health or life in these things, and yet we have done them. Lord, we are without excuse, but we come to you because through Jesus you have promised to forgive the inexcusable and the unthinkable, and that you welcome us up into your arms and you love us, Lord, with the love of a father toward his children. And out of that love, Lord, um, you delight when we reach our arms up in helplessness into your presence. And so, God, we pray that you would forgive us all of our sins. We pray that you would heal us our afflictions and our sicknesses. We pray that you would give rest to the weary, that you would soothe those who are suffering, that you would freshly give a sense of your compassion to those in any kind of affliction, that you would shield those who are joyful, and that, Lord, your way would be known upon all of us. We need to know you afresh this morning. In our weakness, Lord, uh, you are so gracious to remind us that you always care, that you always love us, that you are always our refuge from pain. You are always ready to displace our distress with a sense of your peace and to be our strength where we feel weak and find it hard to carry on. You are such a kind-hearted and gracious Father to us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, you are in control. When our emotions plunge us down, you were there to lift us up. And so we call upon you as Jesus taught us to pray. We, we would not on our own, from creation alone, dare to call you such a kind-hearted and gracious Father, but Jesus taught us. And so now we take the words that Jesus taught us to pray, and we offer this prayer to you, O oh God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art! How great thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior. 
Savior God to Kids can go to uh, Kids Zone now. Like they have. So great to see the life and energy of these kids. We are blessed with like a hundred. Uh, we regularly hit a hundred triple digits of these young people who are being instructed in exciting ways and building relationships with each other. They are the up and coming next generation. And at CLC family, we, we invest a lot in what they're doing. And um, just to give you kind of a sense, uh, it's, this is an exciting season. One is spring is coming, right? It may feel cold, but spring is coming. But it's an exciting season in church life. And I just want to give thanks and glory to God for the spiritual life that he is blessing us with. Um, I'm so grateful to welcome each week. Each week over the past several weeks, um, there has been someone new, a first timer who is investigating CLC. Oh, and along with that, there have been folk who said, I have not been back since COVID. And that's now a thing of the past. And regularly, since we started uh, the second service, uh, we have an attendance that is about double what we were a year ago. Praise God for that. Isn't that exciting? Um, that's a work of God, and that's just, it's one index uh, of what God is doing here. Um, so praise God for that. What, what that introduces to us, though, is we're kind of in that beloved, and I hate to say awkward adolescent phase because I love adolescents, but you know how they grow a little gangly and, and in this way? So we grow in numbers of people that we're serving and that are, you know, coming into the body, but we're catching up in terms of all those volunteer areas. So we're, we're still very much prayerful because we know our two services will really thrive uh, when we're able to offer parallel experiences for families. So, so what we're finding now is some families who come at 1045, they look around and say, where are all the kids' classes? So again, we can only move as fast and as far as the Lord is developing volunteers. So I'm always one to say, uh, you won't hear many pastors say this, but I'll say, you may be volunteering enough. You may be. And we'll just go as far and fast. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in guilt pressure or program pressure. So I'll say the same thing about giving. You know, our giving is, is catching up. It was so strong last year. We are equaling that, but we're also growing in size. You may be giving everything the Lord. Have you ever heard a pastor say, you may be giving everything the Lord has caused you to give? I bet you've never heard a pastor say that. <laughs> um, but I really do, like, pressure's off. There's no pressure. But, but examine it, because when I was thinking about sharing about, like, catching up and the fact that as elders, uh, your elders always are looking to go, uh, you know, in faith, you know, always casting a vision more than what we have, because that's what we should do. God is glorified by faith. But also, we won't, we're not like the federal government. We won't write checks that bounce. We won't, we won't forecast a budget, you know, that is not going to be uh, backed up. So, so examine that, because when we examined it in our family, we're like, hey, we're a little behind in what we intend to give to CLC. So we dropped a check in the basket this morning to say that that was catching us up. So maybe you need to catch up but also pray for us in this season because it's a season of really discerning the best way for us to grow uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit and to be everything that Christ wants us to be in this body. But it is so encouraging. It is, isn't it encouraging to be in a season where we can say, wow, twice as many people as a year ago. <laughs> More uh, new people coming in who say, I've never been there. Um, I'm getting messages that are just delightful. I love messages like this that say like, we've never really cracked open a Bible before. Is that okay? Can we come to things? <laughs> what do you think, congregation? Can they come to things? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, you know, or we've been watching online, and I think we'd like to get our child baptized. Could we talk about that? It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> come to the front of the line. So all those are really exciting things that the Spirit of God is doing. And, and I will say, this week, uh, we conclude this series on bringing heaven to earth by looking at 
how Christ collides with the evil powers, with the spiritual forces of darkness. And uh, this is a fantastic text uh, of scripture and it completes the book of Ephesians. And many quarters of the church, when the word of God is read just out of an act of reverence, that you know, the one thing that will be perfectly stated from this platform today is when we read scripture. It is God-breathed, it is without any error, uh, it is fully trustworthy for us. So I'm gonna invite you, if you're able to, out of reverence for the word of God, just, just to stand in that posture of, of receptivity and hear the word of God and receive it as I read it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus will tell you everything. He is a dear brother and a faithful minister in the Lord. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Lord, we come before your word. We are thankful for these words of great grace and beauty to us. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would impart them anew and afresh in Christ's name. Amen. Well, these verses, taking up the whole armor of God to withstand the devil's schemes, kind of add a new plot line to Ephesians. Um, if I were just brand new to Christianity and reading Ephesians, I would think this, you know, being a pastor and being a member, uh, participant in the body of Christ sound like all great stuff. I mean, we're getting rid of the bad stuff. We're banishing bitterness and anger. We're restoring relationships. We're building these communities that have a sense of mission and purpose and deep affection for one another and deep unity. Um, you know, it's kind of like, imagine if you're, if like the, the great fun of building something. I mean, how many of you have built a, a house? You build a house? Um, I may need you, so I'll look for, I'll look for you. Uh, build a shed, build a shed. Or, or just take on some project that you actually uh, can see the future and it's a great future, okay? It's kind of fun to build something new, to build something that displaces the old, to do something great. But here is the wrinkle in the plot line. We're building this spiritual temple of the church and we're, we're to lay down our lives and relationships, but now he's telling us that while you're building it, there are gonna be snipers hidden in the woods. And they're gonna be shooting at you. They're going to be throwing hand grenades. They're going to be throwing smoke bombs. 
Uh, at night when you're resting, they're gonna come and tear down what you have built up. Uh, would it change how you would go about building something in your backyard if you knew that while you were building it, you were gonna be shot at? <laughs> Um, that's what he's telling us right now. And he's saying that there is an unseen war going on that, that we, are, we are a part of. And we need to recognize that and, and to recognize that that is, is part of the dynamic that goes on. And I believe for, while there are parts of the church that you might say are, are super fixated on that, uh, and, and superstitious about things of spiritual warfare. It's possible to err on that side of giving the invisible uh, world too much credit. Our general tendency, I believe, is to be substitious, to fall into kind of a mere intellectual awareness of what's going on. How, how many of you um, remember the cartoon Scooby-Doo? A lot of you, right? You know, like the plot line of Scooby-Doo was always that there was some property or, uh, you know, some area that was being haunted or cursed, right? Uh, and so uh, they were wondering, you know, is this some kind of sinister supernatural force? But do you know that every time the question is, is this a supernatural force? Is this a ghost? Is this something demonic in, in the realm that's bringing evil in this? You know what the answer of Scooby-Doo was always, uh, the answer was always, well, we have caught the ghost, and then we've unmasked the ghost. Um, silly us, it wasn't anything supernatural, it was just a manifestation of somebody who wanted to lower the real estate value so they could build apartments there or something, right? That's, it was, that's, that's, that's Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo fits the, the modernist idea that there is, is nothing to this. And the Bible has nothing in common with Scooby-Doo. Um, it says that evil is a kind of jousting contest. Um, when it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, what it's saying is that um, our enemy is not other people. It's not just other people. Um, and also our enemy is not simply our own weakness ourselves. You see, if, if you don't understand that there are other enemies, you will, you'll aim at the wrong thing. Um, in fact, in a true jousting contest, uh, the jouster does not try to stab the horse. I'm sure we have some horse lovers here. <laughs> I'm coming to love horses and just the beautiful landscape around it, right? So you'll say, good, the jouster's not trying to, it's a bad jouster if you try to kill the horse. What are you trying to do? <laughs> You are trying to knock the evil combat combatant off the horse. Why do you want to do that? Because you don't want to destroy the horse. The horse is not your enemy. What you want to do, actually, is, is bring the horse into the service of the righteous cause. <laughs> this is why we, our enemy is not against the people outside who don't yet believe. Do you get it? <laughs> our enemy is against... Um, the supernatural evil forces that have deceived uh, or seduced or somehow laid hold of a weakness to cause them to enlist themselves against the one cause of righteousness. Uh, and so the Bible brings us this kind of, of complexity of things. You know, even, even Shakespeare knew it. When he wrote Hamlet, Hamlet says to Horatio, he says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Uh, and so our text says that there are, there are principalities and there are authorities. It mentions the devil himself, uh, but the devil is finite, okay? The, the devil is not equal to God, by the way. The devil is equal uh, to an angel, to a high angel, uh, he can only be in one place at a time. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He's not all-powerful. <laughs> um, God has no opposite. <laughs> God is, is almighty, all-powerful, right? He's, and, and, and so, um, yet he has to have all of these ranks. I mean, he has a bureaucracy he's got to manage. Um, he's got principalities and authorities. He's got spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places. He's, he's, it's really a description of a whole um, 
series of evil authorities working to, with different assignments. They have finite assignments. And it's important that we recognize that in terms of, or else uh, we will uh, become bitter toward other people or we will become extremely discouraged about ourselves. There is, there is a whole intermixing of uh, the opposition of a world that doesn't know God, our own flesh. You know what your flesh is? Your flesh is how you figured out survival in a world where people don't do the right thing always by God and by you. That's basically what your flesh is. It's how to figure life out without God. It's how to figure life out without faith. It's how to respond in a world and survive. And, and your flesh and my flesh will trip us up. And the, the best writers and the best thinkers have known this. Um, one of the pastors who's known uh, is Richard Baxter. He wrote this famous book in 1651 called The Reformed Pastor. Uh, and you'll find in Christian writers a really sophisticated understanding. And he's, he's really writing about, um, again, four dimensions when we feel discouraged or depressed. And he's very sophisticated because he says, first of all, well, it could be sin. It's not always sin. Please don't fall into that blame track. That was Job's friends, right? Job's worthless friends. But sometimes it is. And he says, if it's sin, repent and be forgiven. There are people here today who they are allowing sins of the past, and I do too, sins of the past to frame who they are and, and they need to let that collide with the fact that Jesus Christ himself said, you know, I have authority on earth to forgive sins and, and to bring it to him and, and to confess it and forsake it and know that it is cleansed and it is removed from you as far as the east is of the west. If it's, if it's sin, repent and be forgiven. But he says sometimes it could be physical. It could be physical things. Sleeplessness, poor sleep will mess with our minds and emotions, Right? if you've ever been tormented in a season like that. Um, or lack of, of exercise, 1651, <laughs> he's writing this. Um, and then he mentions, or maybe you've gone through a trauma. Maybe you've had a kind of wound that doesn't just heal itself fast. And, and so he's, I love how he says, he says, get in the care of gentle friends. But he also then says, it could be demonic. And it could even be a demonic um, manipulation of all three of those other things. Um, I've sinned, I've not been sleeping, exercising, um, I've suffered some kind of trauma, but that doesn't mean I'm always innocent. I'm, even when I'm suffering something that I didn't call upon myself, I can respond in a sinful way, and the demonic realm wants to manipulate this so that I am in a constant state of confusion. Amen. There are distinctions to make. And we find when you really look at the Bible very carefully, some people want to say like, oh yeah, the Bible's very primitive. It has this view that everything's a demon. No, it does not. In fact, if you look at the description of Jesus in uh, Matthew 4, it, it has a pretty sophisticated understanding of his understanding. It says that they brought to him all who were ill. Again, some are suffering with various diseases and pains. Then there were demoniacs, those who were oppressed from the demonic realm. Then it talks about epileptics, those who who's lost control of their bodies, maybe throw, threw themselves on the ground. They knew the distinctions, paralytics. And it says that what Jesus did is he manifested the proper power to give what they needed in all of these different compartments. The Bible is extremely and extraordinarily wise. Uh, and so it calls us to, to recognize that uh, and to recognize our attacker, but then it begins to provide us a sense of how we take up the armor uh, in this battle. Um, you'll see this as, as he begins and says, stand therefore, and, and he describes a few pieces of, of the armor. He says the, the belt of truth is, is what holds the gear together. Um, Jesus spoke of truth, he says, that when we're in being dominated. We're just like, we're just being defeated. Um, kind of like the Indiana teams in the NCAA basketball. They're just like, there's just like spiritual force against Indiana. I don't know why it is. It's because they're the righteous state, the righteous team. Um, but, but they just didn't work out, right? 
By the way, my bracket is still number one in the contest with the elders and the staff, so I will boast of that as long as I can. Um, but truth, truth, when we don't have truth, we will be defeated in all ways. Jesus said it is, it is the truth received in the innermost part that sets us free. The reality um, for every kind of addiction um, that confronts a person, and all the people in recovery ministry know this, that the real problem is not relapses and falling into patterns of addiction. The real problem is deception where we're unable to admit it. Um, the hardest thing really is to admit that the pattern is bigger than you. The first step of the 12-step program is, again, that you surrender to God. You surrender knowing that you don't have the power. You can't pull yourself out of this situation. That's the truth that begins to set you free. But until you're honest, in, until you get to that place of honesty, and the Alcoholics Anonymous defines sobriety as honesty. It's not perfection. It doesn't mean there's no relapse. It means that and you are able to be honest with yourself, and you're able to be honest with the people who love you, and you're able to be honest in community. That's the belt of truth. And, and again, Christ provides this because we know we come to a God who doesn't condemn us. We come to a God who has founded a church that is not a place of shame where we, we reattach those bonds. And so it ought to be the place where truth is, is the most welcome because what God desires, he says, is not perfection, but in Psalm 51, he says, I desire truth in your inmost parts. That's, that's the belt of truth around your waist. And, and there's also a, a kind of breastplate that you wear. Uh, that is just that is on you like the truth it's that breastplate of the righteousness that has been accomplished for you that you had nothing to do with earning or deserving but has been given to you as a gift of christ that when christ died on the cross um, our record of sin and failure and relapses was given to him and he was treated as we deserve to be treated but when you have faith in christ you are seen as the perfect representative and and god rewards you and treats you as if you had lived the christ the life that christ had lived that is the gospel and and that is something that you can wake up wearing every day you don't improve it the first day you're a christian you have the breastplate of righteousness you can live for another 50 years and read through the Bible three times a year, pray three hours a day, um, witness and share Jesus in an effective way with everyone you meet, give away half of everything you earn, and guess what? Your breastplate of righteousness has not been approved, improved the least bit. It is as good on the first day when you receive Jesus Christ as it is on the last day when hopefully you've made some so-called progress in the Christian life. And so that, that's what you're wearing, the breastplate of righteousness, and you've got your shoes. Shoes give you stability. They, they enable you to be able to stand and to move about uh, and to have a readiness to take a stand and proclaim. You notice how many times the word stand is here. <laughs> um, all of this armor is for facing problems, again, we can't ask God to fix what we won't face, and he generally, he brings protection and forward movement as we are moving in faith with him. Um, and so he supplies all of this for us in the midst of the battles that we face. Um, you know, I like, I like to serve God in an advisory capacity sometimes. It's not really a position that he has opened up for me to serve in, but I volunteer. And what I say to God when I feel that there are battles and stuff, I say, okay, I'm, I'm here and you've called me to advance, but what I would like you to do first is I'd like you to send in the Air Force and I would like them to go out in front of me and, you know, just kind of like clear the way. And then I would like to hear them hovering right here. And then you do that and I'll, I'll go out and I'll do these things. You ever, you ever feel that way? God, you, you make it all, all risk-free you remove all tension, you remove all enemies, and then I'll move, right? And God always says, um, I mean, it's very interesting that you, a private, are talking to me, the general, the omniscient, the Lord of hosts, the one who can see the end from the beginning, and I can see the whole battlefield, and here's my plan. You step out of where you are and respond in faith, because I've given you the breastplate, okay? Um, I've given you the shoes, um, I've, I've given you what you need in, in terms of positional armor. 
Uh, and so those are, those are the three things that, that are the armor. You've, you've got uh, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and you've got shoes that give you that place to stand. But you know, there are three things that we're called to take up. There are, there are three things that we're called to, to, in a sense, put on every day anew and afresh. And I'm not saying you don't need to freshen all of these in your mind and awareness. But in terms of the armor, uh, three times he says, take something up. And one of the things he says to take up in, is the helmet of salvation. Now, this helps me when I'm in a foxhole. <laughs> Um, I, I can't actually put this thing on. I think it would be inescapable. Um, but <laughs> the helmet of salvation, and when you clamp this thing down, it makes that most vulnerable part, it makes your command center invulnerable. And he's saying that this is something that we can freshly appropriate, and he says to put this on, to, to take this up. It won't stand up on its own, but... Believe me, if it's on your head, you feel, you feel more secure going out into battle. <laughs> um, and then he talks about a shield of faith. And this is something that you take up. It's not like the, the breastplate that is, is on you, but I'm gonna show you just a, a dramatic picturing of this. It's, it's a pretty big um, shield, and here is how it functions, uh, especially it functions in community. We often think of these commands given to just me all alone by myself. And this, these commands are given to a community together. And, and here is the comfort of that. Um, it's a much better picture if you're moving this way, right? If you're, if you're moving in this group, look at that. It's almost like a tank before there were tanks. Uh, it's not just this puny little thing that I'm like hoping to somehow extinguish, um, you know, the, the dart of the enemy, the shield of faith, but we're talking about something like this. We're talking about coverage, and we're talking about being able to move undercover. And this is the, this is the call that we have to, to take agency, to take responsibility, and to, to use what God has given to us in Christ. And there's such freedom in this. When we are, when we are moving in this way, uh, we are moving in the, in the full armor of God, and he says, with all of these. So verse 16 tells us, take up all of them. Uh, don't leave an unguarded place. That's, that's the danger of any place where we have surrendered to darkness, or we have surrendered walking in dark, that it leaves us. Take any of these pieces of armor away, and it opens up a vulnerability. In, in Christ, when we are walking with him, he leaves us with no unguarded place, but he's calling us to walk this out uh, as we deal with this fight. But he's, he's telling us that we have this victory in Jesus Christ and this is why as he moves through this uh, with the sword of the Spirit, and here as he speaks of the Word of God, our, our way of making sure that we're walking in truth is that we can pierce through confusion and we can, we can hold our ground with all of the armor by speaking what God says and by knowing what God has said and applying it to our specific cir circumstance and situation. Probably the most powerful demonstration of this is when Jesus, uh, after strengthening himself by fasting for 40 days, is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And with each response of Satan, he had an apt, like, rapier word to say to him of Scripture perfectly applied. Jesus did that a couple times. <laughs> Uh, he did that re refusing to turn the stones to bread. He did that uh, with... Uh, refusing uh, to have Satan call his agenda. And so Satan quoted scripture at him, if you know that passage. And he said, you know, um, Psalm 91 says that you will not, uh, that God will not allow his chosen one to, to hit their foot against his stone, to be destroyed. So throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. And you know, Jesus' response was from Deuteronomy when he says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In each way, if Jesus needed scripture, how, how much more do we need to fight from the victory that Jesus has for us? And to fight from, from that which he has designed. 
Uh, Scripture gives us uh, the wisdom so that we can fight from the victory that Jesus has accomplished for us, uh, not from our fears or our insecurities. A few years ago, I stumbled across a painting that has a powerful story behind it. Um, the painting is called Checkmate. And you can see it pictured uh, behind me. Uh, it's a picture where you see an extremely frightened young man. If you can, if you can actually see, he's, he's just completely dejected. Uh, and uh, he is facing the foe of all foes. And the checks board, if it's, if it's studied, shows that he is in an impossible situation. He, he is about to be checkmated and and the painting itself is called Checkmate, where Satan wins the game. And this painting was actually seen by the chess master, Bobby Fischer. Um, and Bobby Fischer not only was one of the, the greatest chess players, but he also loved to go to art museums. That was one of his hobbies. And so when he saw this painting, uh, and because he was such a celebrity, <laughs> he, could, he could do what none of us could do. He said, hey, I want the... Uh, uh, the head of the art museum to set up a chessboard for me, just like this chessboard. And they set the chessboard up, and the report was that Bobby Fischer studied this chessboard for six hours, looking at all of the different possibilities. And when he con concluded looking at the chessboard with this young man biting his fingernails, panicked uh, at the fact that he had been penned in uh, with no possible move, um, Bobby Fischer was reported to say this. He said, um, young man, and he said it to the, to the portrait. He says, I wish this young man could hear me for real. But he says, what I would say to him, if he could hear me, I would say, um, I have good news for you. <laughs> Things are not as dark as they seem to be. Uh, I have studied this particular board for more than six hours, and I've discovered that it's all right for you to allow the devil to make this one last move. Because I have found out that there is one more move for you to make on the board. And if you let him make his move, which looks like the end of you, you'll be the one who can say checkmate when you make the move that I will show you across the board. And in fact, Bobby Fischer let that game play itself out. And here, here is the glorious, the news for us in Jesus Christ. That because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, um, he has already won the chess game. Um, we are not fighting for our victory or our lives. We are fighting from victory. Even the enemy himself knows. I mean, I think he's, he knows that it's like watching a DVR game where you know that your team lost. <laughs> Um, you know, you don't have, you don't really have a whole lot of heart. All you can do is maintain uh, maybe a sense of cruel allegiance to your side, but you know the cause is absolutely lost because Colossians 2.15 tells us that Christ Jesus triumphed over all of the evil powers, and it actually says he made a public spectacle of them, having triumphed over them through the power of the cross, that he has triumphed in what was most unthinkable, um, that he would triumph in the midst of the weakness of the cross. And he would triumph in, the, in uh, the greatest humiliation because by getting all the way down underneath our sin, underneath our shame, underneath the things that really can harm us and defeat us, ultimately suffering and trials, uh, they can't defeat us. Uh, but the slightest sin could defeat us and Christ got underneath uh, all of that sin and took on all of that suffering so that the real thing that can destroy a sin itself is, is unable to have sway. And so now we fight from that victory. And that's why when Paul's most important plea, I think, in this whole passage, one that I think that is often underestimated, begins in this verse 18 when he says, Pray. When you are praying, you are praying for the victory that Christ has won uh, to uh, dominate and be involved in the situation that you were in. When you are praying, you're not, you're not face to face with the enemy or even your situation that is driving you crazy. You're not face to face in the conflict. When you were praying, you were face to face with the God who loves you. 
And this is the place where the battle is ultimately won. I like that one pastor who's eminent in prayer. He says, um, a church that will win the victory in prayer will win the victory in all the other areas. And he says, a person who will win the victory in prayer, in strong prayer, wins in all the other areas because prayer is central like nothing else is. Prayer displaces things from our hearts that cannot coexist with faith and intimacy with God. Um, It's true that prayer will either consume our sin or sin will choke out our prayer. That's why he gives a command here. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in a life that is aligned with the purposes of God. Uh, And and that as we do that, as we build on on the victory that Christ has won for us at the cross, that's the place of triumph. That's the place of triumph. Uh, The most important thing we can do, the greatest exertion of strength, is to pray. This is a little snapshot of a group as we've opened a meeting from four to five on Thursdays. We're going to have another meeting that is just for the purpose of prayer. And it was said decades ago, but it was A.W. Tozer who said that it's really hard to get people to attend a meeting where the only attraction is God. I'd like to give the lie to that. Prayer is, the, prayer is the place where the only attraction is God and we are fighting from the victory of Jesus Christ and it is always based on, on a response to the victory of Jesus Christ that is, is praying for that victory to be realized. Prayer is really the source of laying hold, not of, as a writer said, not of God's reluctance but of God's willingness for his church to be beautified for our lives to be strengthened, for us not to live in feebleness, uh, but to live in confidence. Prayer is really the place where we are clothed in power on high. Um, Jesus actually commanded his disciples, not only after the three years, but after 40 days that they had with him, where he was, I think, confirming with miracles right and left of his resurrected power of his ultimate victory and he told them he said even after these three years with me even after those uh you know three days where you turned your back on me and have come back in repentance and you've had 40 days with me of intensive training he says you are not safe for any kind of forward-looking ministry until you were clothed with power on high so i want you to go pray for 10 days he didn't tell them 10 days they didn't know how long They didn't know how long it was going to be before they'd be clothed with power. But the church was built on that kind of prayer. And we know what happened out of that. Uh, The church was really not built by preaching. It was not built by wise visionaries. It was not built by incredible um, giftedness. But it was built by a people who had been shaped by prayer and who knew that what was going to proceed uh, would, would be prayer. Here's the way that Reinhard Bonnke, who uh, had a powerful ministry of evangelism in Africa, put it. He said this. He said, as as powerful as evangelism is, as powerful as simply preaching the gospel is, um, and he lived it and knew it. He says, evangelism is the explosive, but it needs a detonator. (laughs) And the detonator is prayer. Prayer is the detonator, but, but prayer needs an explosive. It isn't that we, we can all be monasteries. I, maybe there are a few people are called to simply devote themselves to nothing else but a life of prayer. But, but generally, what, the way the kingdom advances is that you have a detonator, prayer, and you have the explosive, evangelism, and, and evangelism and intercession and praying are the, are the two feet on which the gospel strides forward. And so Paul, he, he challenges us here, pray in the Spirit, when? At all times. In every kind of prayer and supplication, there are all kinds of different prayers. There are prayers where we're just letting God run through our emotions and we feel it and we experience relief. And other times there are more dutiful forms of prayer where just we say, because we want God to touch something, we want him maybe to touch Avon Grove High School or, or we want him to move in, in a certain place and way. We faithfully give ourselves as a calling of God to pray, whether we feel it or not. We're just, we're dutifully interceding. There are different kinds of prayer, he says, but pray in the spirit. In every kind of prayer and supplication, keep alert, and he says, persevere 
and, in, and especially pray for all of those who are already believers. Such an interesting focus of prayer here. While it's certainly appropriate to pray, pray for those who don't know Christ, what he's saying is, he's saying in a world where so many people are drowning, pray for the lifeguards. So, well, I thought we should pray for the drowning. Yeah, you can pray for the drowning. That's our first reflex. But pray for those who are the lifeguards so that they can be sent into the prey to, to pray for him. And so there's three things that our text tells us. It first of all says we have an attacker. Um, your life right now, and what you may need to be most reminded of this morning is to realize that you don't need to be blaming other people and you also should not simply focus on yourself. You'll, you'll be either blaming other people or you will be discouraged about yourself. You have an attacker who is seeking to be, to be in that mix, to discourage you and to defeat you and to distract you. Secondly, you have armor. You have armor that you don't, you can do nothing to earn or deserve. But simply through coming to Christ and laying your life down, you were clothed in a breastplate that is perfect righteousness. You have a helmet of salvation. You can do nothing to earn or deserve. You were completely decked out, but then you have armor that you must take up if you were to move forward. So you have an attacker, you have armor, and, and where and how do you put the armor on? It's through prayer. Prayer is the aid. Prayer is the requisitions. Prayer is the place where the supply of that armor is freshened in your life. And before we go into our closing song, I want to just give you opportunity to respond to God about the battle that you may be facing, you may be feeling, you may be not feeling enough because you realize there's armor you need to take up and move forward. And then we'll close in worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you call us to fight from victory, not for victory. The Christ has already fought the ultimate battle. And so we pray, Lord, that you would, you would move in our hearts, that we might leave here more ready to advance under his leadership. Lord, forgive us where we have grown discouraged in ourselves because we've seen it only as a battle in our own strength. Lord, forgive us where we have blamed others, the broken world we're in, the systems around us that are, are best seen by people. They're just the conduits. And so help us, Lord, to liberate them and to love them even as we stand firm against the foe. And Father, remind us that there is no such thing as a weak prayer. That you call us, Lord, to be a praying people and that by praying, circumstances are changed, hearts are changed, whole trajectories of individuals and groups and nations and the world is changed because even today the change of what the world is and, and would have been is being accomplished through the prayers of your gathered church. And Lord, encourage us. Encourage us in the victory of Jesus Christ and to fight in that confidence and in that freedom. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.
Cause the God I serve knows only how to try My God will never fail My God will never fail I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every warrior rages He will win Backing down from any giant, no. I know how this story ends. I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good good news for us as we leave this place to take that victory out into the world we live in. And as you do that, I invite you to lift up your hearts to God and receive this benediction, this naming of his power and his reality upon you as you carry this out into the world you live in. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You take what the enemy meant for evil. 
and you take me for good. You take me for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn me for good. Whoa. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good I'm gonna see your victory I'm gonna see your victory For the battle belongs to you Your victory, I'm gonna see your victory. 